We're nearing the end of the damp squib gloats and uh, again I think I've done a pretty good one this month. I've got a good reason to gloat happily this month. It's the 10th out of 12 damp squib gloats so there's only two more to go. There's the one after November and then there's of course the one after the whole year of 2012 will have passed without any serious incident. And then I'm going to have the best gloat of them all, I would hope. But October's one was a good one, because I think I've managed to get Nynania herself to come out of the woodwork. Well, let's put it this way. I cannot imagine anybody other than Nynania herself being as butthurt over the video that this person was commenting on but I do acknowledge that it is, of course, possible that the person who was commenting was really a Canadian meathead who had the hots for Nynania. It's possible. But I think it's a lot more possible that the only person who felt the need to argue with me for a month over a video I made about Nynania is Nynania. Unless, of course, it's Gluteus Illuminatus again, because he once got me real good when he impersonated Nephilim Free, and it is entirely possible that he got me again doing Nynania, in which case, good job Glute, but no, I don't think so. And even if it was, I still think I did a good job this time tearing Nynania or this Canadian meathead or the fake person that Glute was pretending to be, a new one. You see, the thing was, a couple of months ago, this person started first commenting on one of my videos, the one in which I pointed out that Nynania was, as the year 2012 was moving on and nothing was happening, Nynania is starting to move the goalposts and she's now talking about things happening six years down the line, you know, making it conveniently far in the future again, so she doesn't have to worry about it in the immediate future. And this guy started getting all upset about it, or rather, I'm going to start saying from now on, I'm going to pretend this is just Nynania herself, because that's the most likely thing. She got all upset about this and started posting comments on my video. And eventually, in a fit of pique, she posted one, vi one comment, one specific comment, in which she announced that something significant was due to happen on the 17th of October 2012. Yes, the 17th of this month, the one just gone. And of course, I laughed my ass off at this. Now, we need to understand the context of what was being said here, because she pointed out that the 17th of October was going to be significant and she pointed this out in the context of a timeline and in the very comment in which she mentions the 17th of October the first time, she is very clearly talking about earthquakes. So immediately I made a counter prophecy, as I want to do, saying that there would be no significant earthquake, no major earthquake. So at very, very least magnitude 8 on the 17th of October. And of course there wasn't, as you will know, can now all verify for yourself. But again, as the day was starting to get nearer, this person started to get more and more kind of edgy and started to realize that this was all going to fall flat on its face and started throwing the net wider and wider. And eventually she started talking about Alanin like events and as a proof of the accuracy of a prediction and remember on the 17th of October really nothing at all happened of any significance but she did point out that there were apparently a couple of near-earth objects passing the earth within one lunar distance. Now that sounds scary these are big rocks several tenths of meter in diameter, which pass closer than the distance of the moon to the earth. The only thing is that this sort of an occurrence happens on average about once every month. So unless this actually happened on the exact date, 
Even then it's insignificant. But it didn't happen on the date. Now it happened on the 5th and it happened on the 12th. So <laughs> in sheer desperation she started pointing out that 5 plus 12 equals 17. But in any case she started going on about Alanin like events. And I pointed out to her what's actually Alanin like about this. Let's compare what we're comparing here. Let's look at what we are comparing here. On the one hand we have meteors, near-Earth objects that pass within one lunar distance of the Earth. These objects originate most likely from somewhere in the asteroid belt, thereabouts. So they have always been in this sort of area of the solar system. And as I said, they were just rocks that passed the Earth within a certain distance. Alanin, on the other hand, was a comet which therefore originated somewhere in the Oort cloud or thereabouts, far, far away. It's a comet. And also, it's a comet that has by now completely disintegrated and ceased to be anything of any significance. The two rocks that did pass us within a lunar distance and that didn't do anything to the planet Earth, by the way, just went on, went on their merry way and nothing has happened to them. They are still fully intact. So what is the connection there? Where is the Elenin likeness there? Another thing that they pointed out was that somewhere in California or Arizona or Louisiana, I don't remember exactly where, some people saw a fireball in the sky. Surely that's an Elenin like event. Um, go check the news. Just Google for the words fireball and sky and go for the, the last 24 hours. So just in today, check for that and you'll see that there are reports all over the world of the odd fireball in the sky. Meteorite strikes are amazingly common, folks. There are regularly fireballs in the sky and even sonic booms from meteors. There's nothing special about any such event. But in any case, and this is the most beautiful part of this, Nynenia, as she was trying to sell this as anything significant and it getting nearer and nearer to the 17th of October, eventually realized that this wasn't going anywhere and tried another tactic. And now she alerted me to some crazy data coming from a buoy in the Indian Ocean. Now, for those of you who don't know what's going on here, after the devastating earthquake on the 26th of September, December 2004, a number of countries around the Indian Ocean have installed a number of tsunami warning buoys systems. And the system that is employed in this particular instance, this particular buoy that was giving off these strange data, this consists of two parts. It's the, the DART2 system. You can look it up, D-A-R-T, DART, and then the Roman number 2. Look it up, there are schematic pictures and stuff of what that system actually looks like. You can Google that for yourself. And one of these buoys came up with some very anomalous data. According to this particular buoy, the water column, which is the, the height of the water above the tsunometer, the actual part of the system that measures whether the water is going up and down, had registered a decrease of over 320 meters. Now all the lunatics jumped on this and said, this shows that somehow the seafloor has risen by 320 meters. Yeah, or the buoy has just gone wonky. What do you think is more likely? Now, I started off by pointing out to her 
to 99 yeah, or her sock account or whatever it was, I started off by pointing out to her that, okay, let's just compare what we, what we are apparently looking at with what we know about what really happened on the 26th of December 2004. The earthquake that caused the tsunami was a magnitude of 9.1 to 9.3 thereabouts. The result of this earthquake was a change, change in the seafloor level of 15 meters. I would like that to sink in to you. 15 meters caused an earthquake of a magnitude between 9.1 and 9.3 and a tsunami that killed thousands of people. And a 320 meter rise of the seafloor supposedly happens with nothing other to show for it than some crazy data on one or two tsunameters, buoy systems, no seismic activity that anybody knows about, and no tsunami that has been reported by anybody. Hmm, I wonder, what is more likely now? Yeah, I think we can safely assume wonky data on the buoy. Don't you? But of course, Nainania was having none of this. She said, the data are real, the data are real, you can't argue with the data. Well, actually, I can. And this is where it gets really funny. You see, these buoys don't just come out of nowhere and don't just appear by magic in the Indian Ocean. They are placed there by somebody and they are observed by somebody. So I looked up where the data actually came from and I found the actual page on which this data was published and I found it was owned by the National Data Buoy Center. Good! So I sent them an email and as I told them, I actually alerted them to the fact that the particular readings from this particular buoy had drawn the attention of quite a few of the whack jobs that are out there and whether they could give me a sane perspective on what was, what was going on. And they immediately came back. They actually were very friendly. They, I was amazed with how willing and how happy they were to respond to my silly little email. And they came back to me and they told me, yes, the data coming from this buoy is anomalous and we can confirm that there was no seismic or tsunami activity in the region at all at this time. So the most likely cause is that the buoy is faulty. But I didn't just leave it there because what they also told me was that the, um, the buoy itself was actually operated and owned by the Australian um, Institute for Meteorology. I'm, I'm going to look it up and I'll put it in the underbar. They told me who owned the buoy. And this is another very interesting observation. The National Data Buoy Center is an American institution. It is located in the United States of America. The buoy is owned by an Australian organization, which is a different country for those of you who aren't aware of such things. Australia and America are different countries they are on different parts of the globes. They have different governments. Yes, honestly. And I contacted the Australian organization and they confirmed to me that the buoy's data was anomalous, that there was a problem with it, and that this is most likely, the most likely cause for this. Again, I was amazed with how willing these people are to actually communicate with silly little people like me who have nothing better to do than to argue with idiots on the internet. But hey, these people are willing to share their information. They are open with their information. And these people came back to me and says, well, you know, what's most likely to have happened is that the tsunameter probably, or the buoy, but most likely the tsunameter, got caught up in 
a fishing net or something of so it somehow got managed to get itself entangled with a boat and as a result got dragged along the seafloor for a couple of miles whatever until it got released again and then of course being in a completely different location after having suffered this trauma of being dragged along by a boat all its data are completely unreliable somebody has to go out there into the indian ocean go to that buoy make sure it gets put back to where it should be that it gets recalibrated and then and only then are its data going to be reliable again but what's most important is that my initial hunch I mean talk about the bleeding obvious was obviously correct the buoy is wonky I know governments don't tell the truth a lot of the time I know a lot of what the governments do cannot be trusted but that doesn't mean that you can simply switch your brain off and become a paranoid imbecile and start believing in every stupid conspiracy crap and every half-baked hair-brained idea that people posts on the internet that is just idiotic and because I've had such a great interaction with these people on these sites and I managed in the process to po Nainania or whoever it was I was talking to I think this was a very fruitful month and therefore you're getting this really extended damp squib gloat only two more to go see you in January